It is no secret that 1950s America was a hotbed of hatred, with both racism and McCarthyism flourishing during the decade. It is an era that is romanticized with people fondly remembering false skirts, ice cream parlors, and rockabilly music. But nostalgia is a deadly deceiver and can never be trusted to show the whole truth. The 1950s were also home to some of America's most heinous crimes. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be looking at two unsolved cases from the 1950s. The Walker Family Family and friends of the Walkers should have been able to celebrate their Christmas together with them in 1959, but due to the actions of one or multiple unidentified culprits, they ended up mourning the loss of their loved ones, grieving instead of enjoying the festive season. On the morning of December 20th, 1959, in Osprey, Florida, a ranch worker named Daniel McLeod went to pick up his colleague, 25-year-old Cliff Walker, as the pair planned to spend the day hog hunting. When Daniel pulled up his truck, however, he noticed the quiet stillness of the house and immediately felt a wave of anxiety hit him. Something was wrong. Cliff and his wife, 24-year-old Christine, had two young children, a little boy, Jimmy, who was three, and a little girl, Debbie, who was just one year old. As a result, the family were often up at the crack of dawn, and the house they lived in constantly buzzed with the flurry of life. Daniel got out of his truck and headed to the front door of the walker's home. He knocked, but there was no answer. Concerned for the family's well-being, he then cut through the screen door and made his way into the home. What he found was a bloodbath. Christine was the first he saw. She was lying in the living room doorway, a 22 caliber bullet had been put through her skull. Later, law enforcement would discover that she had been sexually assaulted before meeting her demise. As Daniel looked around the room, he saw the bodies in the corner of Cliff and Jimmy. Both had been shot in the head. Debbie was nowhere to be seen, but Daniel had seen enough. He retreated from the house and called the local police department, who arrived and found one-year-old Debbie in the bathtub. She had been shot and drowned. It has been theorized that the perpetrator drowned the little girl because they ran out of ammo and she didn't immediately pass away from the gunshot wound. Police in Osprey had their work cut out for them. They managed to ascertain that Christine had arrived home first after a day of running errands at 4 p.m. and that Cliff, with the children, had arrived sometime after. Since Christine had time to put the shopping away, it's been suggested that she knew the perpetrator and had possibly spent time speaking with them before she was attacked. What was also evident was that Christine had put up a ferocious fight against the culprit using her high heels, which were found with blood on them in the front porch. Authorities also discovered that several items were missing from the family's home. Cliff's pocket knife, Christine's high school majorette uniform, and the couple's marriage certificate. All of these items seemed peculiar things to steal, and the idea was proposed that Christine was the true target of the attack, and the culprit was in love with her or an ex-boyfriend of hers. Although police had a lot of theories, their evidence was limited. They found a cellophane strip from a cool cigarette wrapper, a fingerprint on the bathtub faucet, and a single bloody cowboy boot presumably one that belonged to the family, although it is unclear. It's also noted that the perpetrator locked the front door behind them. In all, 587 people were considered suspects at one time or another. The suspect list included Daniel, who'd found the family's bodies, a neighbor who'd reportedly made advances towards Christine, and Albert Walker, 
a cousin of Cliff's who had violent tendencies. A former partner of Christine's, a man named Curtis McCall, was also investigated. Rumours of an affair between the couple had made their rounds through the local town, and while McCall denied the rumours, he was never fully ruled out, although there was no evidence against him either. Regardless, none of these suspects panned out, and the motive behind the brutal slaying of the Walker family has never been identified. At some point after the murders, a serial killer named Emmett Monroe Spencer claimed that he was the perpetrator, but this confession was later discredited as Spencer was a known pathological liar. It was believed that Spencer had constructed his confession from murder write-ups in the local papers and the crime novels that he liked reading. After that, the Walker family case went cold for several decades. Then, in 2012, the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office began investigating links between the case and convicted murderers Perry Smith and Richard Hickok. The pair were career criminals who were convicted of killing four members of the Clutter family in Kansas in 1959 and were later executed in 1965 for the slayings. The Clutter family murders were discussed in the popular book In Cold Blood, which was also published in 1965. In the book, the author dismissed the idea that Smith and Hickok were responsible for the Walker family massacre because they had an alibi for the time in which the executions occurred. However, records and witnesses from investigators in Kansas and Florida contradict this account. Smith and Hickok had been considered suspects as far back as 1960. 34 days before the Walker murders, the criminals fled to Florida in a stolen car and checked into a motel just four hours away from Osprey. They then checked out on the morning of the Walker family massacre and were caught on December 30th, 1959 in Las Vegas, Nevada. A polygraph test issued in 1960 appeared to clear the pair of any involvement, but it is well known today that polygraph tests don't really prove anything and aren't even admissible in court. Experts have also noted that 1960 polygraph machines were famously inaccurate. In December of 2012, investigators announced that they were seeking an order to exhume Smith and Hickok's bodies for DNA. They hoped that it would match the semen sample which was taken from the Walker's crime scene. This exhumation was eventually carried out, but in 2013, it was announced that the DNA evidence from the bodies could not be conclusively matched to the crime scene evidence because it was contaminated. Only partial DNA was extracted from the crime scene sample, meaning that it neither proved nor disproved the pair's involvement in the case. Despite this setback, the pair remained the most viable suspects in the Walker's murder. Not only did witnesses see the two in the area at the time of the massacre, but a similar pocket knife to Cliff's was also found when the men were arrested. Some have theorized that while in Florida, the pair knocked on the door of the Walker family and offered to sell them the car they'd stolen, a 1956 Chevy Bel Air, like the one that Cliff wanted to purchase, and Christine let the men inside. However, other online sleuths have argued that it seems more likely that the callous slaying of the family was more personal, given the items that were lifted from the home afterwards. In recent years, the marriage certificate that was taken has been recovered by Cliff's niece, who found it in amongst other items that were given to her by a family member. It is unknown if this unidentified family member was ever looked into by authorities. As of 2020, the Walker family massacre remains unsolved. Malvina Krutz. On January 29th, 1958, 48-year-old Charles E. Krutz returned home from work at around 5 p.m. He lived in a one and a half story home in a quiet neighborhood in Indianapolis's north side with his 41-year-old wife, Malvina, and their 10-year-old son, Charles Crutz Jr., who more often than not went by the name Buddy. At first, nothing seemed amiss in the house. Buddy was already home and had been for around an hour and a half. He was sitting in front of the TV, engrossed in an episode of his favorite show, The Adventures of Wild Bill Hickok. Charles's wife, Malvina, was nowhere to be seen or heard. 
as she was currently overseeing renovations to the family home, which had sustained damage from a house fire the previous month, it was not unusual for her not to be around. She often nipped out for errands, meetings with laborers, or had paperwork to finish up. When Charles asked his son about his mother's whereabouts, Buddy told him that he assumed she was doing his paper route. Reportedly, when Buddy came home for lunch earlier in the day, his mother had told him not to worry about it and that she'd do it for him. This seemed like a reasonable answer until Buddy told his father that he didn't like the look of his bedroom. He mentioned that his toys were in disarray. Confused, Charles decided to wash up before he investigated, but when he stepped into the bathroom, a feeling of uneasiness washed over him. The shower curtain had been pulled closed. When he drew the curtain back, Charles found his wife in the bathtub, lying on her side, submerged in water. Malvina's head was towards the faucet, her legs bent at the knees, and the tub had been filled to the overflow valve. The tap had been turned off. Charles noted that the body and the water were both still warm. Malvina had suffered cuts to the inside of her lips, bruises on the left eye, chin, each arm above the elbow, and on her left leg above the knee. The 41-year-old's white blouse had been ripped at the back, her cardigan was torn, and her underwear had been rolled down to her knees. She still wore shoes, and her trousers were later found soaking wet, inside out, on the floor of Buddy's bedroom. It was later determined that despite the state of her body, Malvina had not been sexually assaulted. Her official cause of death was listed as drowning, and the coroner believed she had been struck in the face or head before being placed in the water. By all accounts, Malvina was a kind and pleasant woman. She was not the type of person who people might expect to meet a violent end. Her neighbors described her as warm and friendly, while friends called her vivacious and active. Aside from being a mother and a housewife, she was also a PTA volunteer and a church worker. When police arrived on the scene, they began to put together the events of the 41-year-old's day. Earlier that afternoon, her friend, Mildred Warning, accompanied by another friend, Florence Cubitt, stopped by to see the renovation in progress. According to Mildred, the pair had called Malvina at around 12.45 p.m. to let her know they would be coming, but instead of being greeted by the housewife's warm voice, they instead heard the sound of an unfamiliar man on the other end of the phone. It was not the voice of her husband, Charles. Mildred assumed that it was one of the workmen and asked to speak to Malvina. The man hesitated and Mildred then told the stranger to tell Malvina they were coming. She then heard Malvina's voice call through, quote, tell her I'll pick her up at 1.30. Although another source reports that Malvina said, quote, tell her not to pick me up today. Regardless, an hour later, Mildred and Florence arrived at the home. As they drove towards Malvina's house, they saw a man run from it, get into her car, and drive away. While at first confused, the two friends soon dismissed this as a builder going for materials. This was something that happened frequently. There was no answer at the front door when the women knocked, so they made their way to the back door, which they found ajar. Inside, the pair waited for 20 minutes, but Malvina never showed. Before leaving, they left a note for her, and a new jacket for Buddy. When the police later asked the two women about who they'd seen get into the car, neither could identify him or describe him, but a 16-year-old neighbor claimed it was a black man who had been driving. Earlier that day at 12.10 p.m., Buddy came home from school for lunch. His meal was already waiting for him when he arrived, and he noticed that his mother's car was still in the garage. A milkman who was delivering around this time also spotted the car there. While Buddy was eating lunch, Malvina called out to him from the bathroom, telling him about how she would do his paper route. Although Buddy reportedly heard his mother, there is no evidence that states he physically saw her. The following morning, Malvina's car, a two-tone white and gray hardtop 1955 Buick, was located 11 blocks away, abandoned on the 4926 North Meridian Street. Although the area was searched, the car keys could not be located, and they were not inside the vehicle either. Confusingly, multiple witnesses claimed the car had been there since the morning of the 28th, the day before Malvina was found dead. 
a few notable pieces of evidence were found in the Krutz family home. Police ruled out robbery as a motive because they found expensive valuables and jewelry still present, and Malvina's purse and cash remained untouched. During their search of the house, however, they found three fingerprints which did not belong to the family. They also discovered a pencil which had strands of hair stuck to it found in Buddy's bedroom. Bloodied pillows were also found here. It is believed that the pencil was used to create the small cuts to Malvina's forehead and scalp. The pencil in question seemed like a strong lead initially. Charles claimed he had never seen it before, and it was inscribed with the words White County REMC Monticello, Indiana. It was traced back to the Rural Electric Membership Corps who had distributed thousands of similar pencils and used them in their offices and branches. However, they were also left in the vestibule of the office building, meaning anyone could have gone inside and picked one up. This led investigators back to a dead end. The results of any testing done on the hair found with the pencil, if any was carried out, have not been made public. Other pieces of evidence found included a blood-stained towel that was discovered behind the kitchen door and a chrome towel rail that was located in the bathroom sink, leading investigators to theorize that Malvina had come to and begun to fight off her attacker before being drowned. Law enforcement had their pick when it came to suspects as laborers were constantly going in and out of the house. At least four men were confirmed to be working on the Krutz family home on the day that Malvina met her end, but all four men were cleared after questioning, although more continued to be interviewed by police. One man in particular was noted to be unable to account for his whereabouts during the time of the slaying, although nothing further seems to have come from this. Several more suspects were questioned and released. None have been publicly named, and it's unclear how many there was. A hitchhiker, who was also an ex-convict from Alabama, was picked up and questioned in January, but was quickly released. A 62-year-old man was also interviewed, but neither his nor the ex-convict's prints matched those found in the Krutz family home. Local sex offenders were investigated, and in February of 1958, an unidentified woman was questioned, but then released after passing a lie detector test. Police were meeting so many dead ends that they began to wonder if perhaps Malvina had acquaintances that her husband and friends did not know of. Malvina's husband, Charles, was also considered a suspect at one point. It was revealed that the 41-year-old had filed for divorce on January 13th, citing, quote, marital misconduct and gross and wanton negligence of conjugal duties over a 10-year period. A hearing concerning a restraining order was scheduled for the 17th, but neither Charles nor Malvina turned up, leading to the divorce suit being dropped. According to Charles, the pair had decided to reconcile. Malvina's lawyer confirmed that this was true. She had apparently done the same in the early 1950s by filing for divorce before reconciling once again with her husband. The pair were due to appear in court on January 30th in regards to their earlier failure to appear in court. Charles was able to provide an alibi for the day of Malvina's demise on January 29th. He spent most of the day at his office, where he worked as a sales manager for the Southern Transportation Company, but left for three hours when he went to visit a friend who corroborated his story, as did the friend's landlady. Detectives were unsatisfied with this alibi, however, and asked Charles to take a polygraph test. He agreed, but asked that they do it after Malvina's funeral. One of the first police officers on the scene, James Mullen, noted several discrepancies in Charles's statements. The 48-year-old said he had entered through the front door, but later said he'd entered through the back. He also told law enforcement officers that he'd taken off his watch and jewelry upon arriving home, but that he hadn't changed his shirt before he found the body. However, James Mullen noticed that the shirt he was wearing appeared fresh and unworn. On February 7th, Charles and his friend, Charles Fleck, both passed polygraph tests. Charles Crutz was reported to have been cooperative and keen to help, and he was questioned for a total of four and a half hours. Another lead investigators had was that of the strange, anonymous phone calls that were repeatedly made to Malvina's husband in the days following her passing. The calls were often received at night, 
and a woman with a slight southern accent would ask, is this Mr. Krutz? And then hang up when Charles confirmed that it was. According to Mildred Warning, the man who had answered the phone on the afternoon of January 29th had also a slight southern accent. This led police to believe that the two individuals may know each other and that the woman possibly knew the identity of the man. They worried the unidentified man might take steps to silence the woman. Despite this, nothing more came from this lead. On February 24th, a local painter named Lenroy Pennick was brought before the municipal court in regards to the execution of Malvina Krutz. He had reportedly been uncertain about dates when he was questioned and his account of the day was very jumbled. His polygraph showed signs of deception. His house was searched, but nothing was found. On March the 2nd, the case was dropped. Four years later, Pennock was arrested in connection to the death of his live-in girlfriend, Carol Jean Martin. He originally said another man was responsible, but then said she'd slipped and fallen after arriving home drunk and picking a fight with him. In 1963, he was convicted of second degree murder. Although he was questioned again about Malvina, he did not reveal anything new and denied involvement. Then, on June 12th, 1958, 25-year-old James Rogers turned himself into police for forging checks and committing several armed robberies. During questioning, he claimed that his friend, who had been a painter on the Krutz property, was responsible for Malvina's demise. He later changed this story when he was questioned by Indianapolis police, saying he himself was responsible. He told the story that he'd met Malvina at a restaurant and she had invited him home. There, he got mad and hit her in the side of the head with his fist. She fainted, and so he dragged her to the bathroom and placed her in the tub, turning on the cold water. When Malvina didn't come to, Rogers claimed that he left her, drove her car away, parked up, and then tossed the keys into a nearby vacant lot. Although the car was left abandoned at the same address Rogers gave, the keys were never located. Although investigators were excited about this development, they were also skeptical. Much of the information that Rogers gave was available in the newspapers, and some parts of his story simply didn't add up. A polygraph test administered by police suggested that he was lying, and Rogers then revealed that he was. He then gave investigators the name of the true culprit, and this man was investigated, only to be cleared. Rogers then gave several different names afterwards, all proving to be false leads. In total, between 200 and 250 people were interviewed in connection with the death of Malvina Krutz. Online sleuths have suggested that perhaps it was Charles and that the man he'd gone to see earlier that day was actually his lover. This could account for why Malvina wanted a divorce. It's also been theorized that one of the laborers was responsible, but there were so many of them going in and out of the house that it muddied the investigation. Another element which severely affected the inquiry was that the case changed hands several times and at one point was led by seriously inexperienced investigators. The final theory discussed in regards to Malvina's case is the idea that Buddy was responsible. This is due to the fact that Buddy was home for an hour and a half and didn't once use the bathroom, there was only one in his home, nor was he phased by the wet trousers or blood-stained pillows found in his room. However, many have argued against this idea, considering Buddy was just 10 years old at the time. If he had anything to do with the attack on his mother, it seemed likely he would have gotten help from his father, as he wouldn't be able to lift or move the body on his own. However, all of this is just speculation, and we may never know the truth about Malvina Krutz's unjust slaying. To this day, her case continues to go unsolved. And there you have the facts two unsolved cases from the 1950s. Please leave a comment with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. If you're still hungry for true crime content, you can also check out the Cold Case Detective podcast by following the link below. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.